Oh, where? Thank you. So yeah, Megan and I will be talking today about uh, genotinary tuberculosis. It's a clinical pathologic correlation rounds, and thanks very much, Dr. Jones, Dr. Bowie, and Dr. Rowley for uh, coming to speak to us today about your respective um, parts. So an outline for what we'll be talking about, uh, we'll be discussing the epidemiology, clinical ma manifestations, and the diagnosis of GUTB. We have two cases of uh, GUTB to present. Uh, the first case is uh, one of Megan's cases along with Dr. Eng uh, down at St. Paul's Hospital where there was TP, TB in a transplanted kidney. And the second case was a case of Dr. McLaughlin's and Dr. Patterson's where uh, TB was masquerading as a stone. We'll go on to talk about the radiologic diagnosis by Dr. Rowley, the, path, uh, the pathologic features with Dr. Jones, medical management with Dr. Boy, and we'll talk briefly on the surgical management as well. So tuberculosis, uh, its incidence is rising worldwide accounts for about 2 million deaths every year. Uh, it's estimated that a third of the world's population are infected, uh, the majority of which are in the developing world. And uh, obviously... <laughs> Is this 2012? Yeah. 2010. And obviously the uh, urologist awareness is important to, um, to diagnose this and diagnose it early. It needs to be in our differential diagnosis um, whenever we see somebody um, in order to pick it up. And so this is a, a map in 2010 the worldwide incidence of uh, tuberculosis. We're relatively lucky in North America. Um, lower, lower rates, but as you can see, there's fairly high rates in Africa, Asia, uh, South America, and with all the travel and immigration, obviously you can see how this could uh, impact the patients that we see. And here's a map of uh, British Columbia. This is for 2008, uh, the active cases of TB. Uh, the highest rates in the province are seen in the lower mainland area. Um, and then again, the higher proportion of cases up in the north with the Aboriginal population being a risk factor. So the incidence of uh, genitourinary tuberculosis, it accounts for about 4% of all primary uh, TB. And um, genitourinary TB accounts for about 30 to 40% of all extrapulmonary uh, tuberculosis. <coughs> so what are the risk factors for uh, GUTB or TB in general? Uh, close contact with uh, suspected or known cases of TB, immunocompromised individuals, uh, travel to the areas endemic with TB, crowded living conditions, such as prison and sh um, homeless shelters, urban poor, such as those in the downtown east side, and of course anybody who works with uh, any of these groups, which includes most of us in this room today. So the pathogenesis of tuberculosis, it's spread by the airborne route, um, seeds in the lungs, and at that point the infection is either established or aborted as it's um, taken care of by the immune system. Once it is established, it's spread by a hematologic route. Uh, it has two paths. It can either go to the kidney first, um, as far as the GU tract is concerned, or it can go straight to the, um, the genital tract and the epididymis itself. Uh, from the kidney uh, cortex, it goes into the medulla, the calyces, renal pelvis, finally through the ureter to the bladder and then um, can seed uh, this way into the genital tract as well. So TB in this way is a unique pathogen in the urinary tract in that it's a descending infection rather than an ascending infection that we typically see. <coughs> so Megan will talk a bit about the um, clinical manifestation. So clinically the uh, manifestations of TB are nonspecific and quite vague but they are often the first clue for diagnosis of TB. Um, men are more commonly infected, and they usually present in their fourth decade of life. And about 50% will present with, with storage symptoms, so uh, urgency, frequency, occasional dysuria. About 33% will have hematuria or flank pain, and about 10% will have renal colic secondary to uh, cases material or clots, or um, even a stone from the t TB. Interestingly, only 20% will present with constitutional symptoms that we think of with TB. So as physicians, we need to have a high clinical index index of suspicion if we think somebody has TB, if they've traveled or they're at a high risk group or they're immunocompromised. And also if their our initial medical management fails to treat the symptoms that they have, we need to be on the lookout. The physical exam is actually of limited use only because if when you do have physical signs, it's usually a late development in the disease. So for uh, people that do have GU, TB, about 50% will have a normal exam, and this can include um, epididymal nodularity, scrotal wall thic thickening, a hydrocele, beating of the spermatic cord, or enlarged uh, firm SVs or a nodule in the prostate. 
We have several different modalities for diagnosing TB. Uh, we'll talk about a few of these today, and then Dr. Rolly will be talking about um, the, the rheological uh, diagnosis. So almost all these patients end up getting urinalysis, and most commonly they show sterile pyuria, so there's white blood cells and no bacteria. They can occasionally have microscopic hematuria and proteinuria, and then um, the urine is always sent for microscopy for acid fast bacilli. However, um, it's a very low uh, sensitivity in the test, and they're often negative. So then we always send the urine for culture, but um, to actually get a reliable culture takes a really long time, and it's quite cumbersome in that you need three to five AM samples of urine. And this is preferred over the 24-hour urine collection because prolonged um, exposure of the bacterium to the uh, uh, acid in the urine actually slows the growth of the bacteria, or of the mycobacterium. 20% will actually have a superimposed bacterial infection, and although this test is very specific for TB, um, the sensitivity is not uh, great. Everybody knows about the TB skin test, so it's the when we inject the purified protein derivative into the um, intradermally into the dorsal aspect of the skin, and then we read it 48 to 72 hours later. If the person's been exposed to TB, they mount a T-cell-mediated delay-type hypersensitivity response to the um, injection of the, the antigen. However, there's some problems with this test in that um, you can have a false positive if you've had a previous BCG vaccine, and also uh, high false negative rates are seen in the settings of malignancy, people who are immunos on, immunocompromised, have liver disease, chronic kidney disease, and actually, um, I found that about 50% of people who are on hemodialysis actually are allergic to uh, the TB skin test. They are immune unresponsive to this test. So one way to combat this is the interferon gamma release assay. So what this is, is the patient's blood is drawn, and um, it's an in vitro assay where they quantify the interferon gamma re response of lymphocytes to the specific TB-specific TB antigens. And so the person will mount a cell-mediated immune response. And the advantage of this test is that you can be done a single visit where they draw the blood. You can assess multiple TB antigens simultaneously, and you get rid of that bias um, from a reader bias, bias when they look at the skin um, mound for the TB skin test. It lacks cross-reactivity with the immunizations, so you get rid of the false positive. And also we include a positive control to exclude energy. So people who are immune unresponsive, it will come up as an inconclusive test in the positive control. So this has been used a lot more in the setting um, of immunocompromised patients and uh, our, our chronic kidney disease patients. Um, imaging diagnosis, traditionally they've used intravenous urography. However, this has been um, mainly supplanted by the CT scan because it's more sensitive for detecting uh, extrapulmonary manifestations and also for calcifications. But when you, you'll see some of our imaging that comes up that um, with the IV urogram, you can see the, the pipe stem or beading or corkscrew ureter that is classic for TB, and we do have an image of this um, in Nathan's case. And finally, retrograde and anterograde pilogram are not commonly used anymore. Um, it will be used if there's obstruction and you need to put in a stent either anterograde or retrogradely or if you need selective uh, urine cultures from a, one of the kidneys to see which one is affected, this can be used. And cystoscopy and uterospere have a limited use as there's no pathomonic finding for, uh, specific for TB. You may see some ulcerative lesions um, or erythematous patches that may mimic malignancy and they should be biopsied, but uh, you cannot biopsy um, anything when there's active uh, or acute TB. So Megan, if you see a casein granuloma in a biopsy, you're saying that's not pathomonic? Um, casein, classic casein. Well, I, I think on the biopsy, yes, but when you're just looking um, at the specimen, so like when you're when, yes, macroscopic. So case one is a case of Dr. Engs, and he's a 56-year-old male who um, has end-stage renal disease secondary to autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. He received a cadaveric renal transplant in Calgary in 1995. Postoperatively, unfortunately, he had deterioration of his renal function and um, had multiple biopsies showing chronic allograft rejection. In July of 2010, he was restarted on uh, intermittent hemodialysis. Presented, I believe, a few months later um, with a history of fever, chills, and night sweats. He was fatigued. Um, he hadn't made any urine since being started on hemodialysis, so there was no hematuria or dysuria frequency. He, on exam, had mild discomfort over the allograft, and he had palpable, non-tender polycystic kidneys. 
So he went on to have a year analysis showing uh, sterile pyuria. He had um, the sequence of events who actually had a CT scan, that, and we'll show you the findings of this in the management to come. But he had a urine microscopy for AFB that was positive, and his TB culture grew mycobacterium uh, avium. So this is the uh, second case. It's the case of Dr. McLaughlin. It was a 37-year-old gentleman. Um, presented originally to his family doctor with some flank pain, a uh, bit of microscopic hematuria, had a fever on and off for a few months. Um, the GP organized a KUB, which showed a presumed distal ureteric stone. Uh, he was referred to um, urology and um, was set up for ESWL in the stone center here. And um, Dr. McLaughlin saw the patient, uh, saw the, the KUB and the, the fluoroscopic images and thought it didn't quite look just like a kidney stone. Uh, Dr. Harris came in and had a look at it as well. It was decided to proceed with um, uh, CTKUB, uh, which showed uh, some findings that we'll talk about uh, in the imaging section, and then finally a CT abdo pelvis uh, uh, was performed. Um, otherwise, he was a healthy gentleman. Um, his risk factors for TB included that he was an immigrant from the Philippines, and on question, he did have some relatives in the Philippines who were affected by tuberculosis, and he also worked as a prison guard as well. Um, he had a normal physical exam. As we know, the physical exam is not um, terribly contributory. The urinalysis showed hematuria and pyuria. His um, urine AFB was positive. And uh, important to ask the lab at VGH anyways to, uh, you have to call them specifically to get an AFB here, as they won't um, process a sample if we just order it. It has to be a phone call as well. And then the urine um, CNS grew uh, tuberculosis as well. So now we will have Dr. Rowley talk a little bit about some of the um, imaging specific to case number one and two. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Rowley. These are case one or two? Nope, these are just uh, your control slide. Control <laughs> slide, okay, which I haven't seen yet. Um, this is, uh, these aren't related to either of the cases we have today, but it just actually uh, shows uh, some of the findings. Just quickly looking at it, I haven't seen these before, but this is what we actually see more commonly here is burned out end stage TB where you get diffuse calcification uh, of the whole kidney. Uh, often small and even denser uh, calcification, the whole kidney gets very, very small. Burned out end stage and often asymptomatic. Uh, I'm not sure what this case is uh, showing. It looks like the truncated upper infundibulum there uh, from uh, inflammatory changes of the uh, urethelium, uh, but uh, you really can't see the, I think the case show, coming later shows better uh, ureteral changes than that one does. This is the case one from, this is actually from St. Paul's, and uh, we've only, I've only got five images that were uh, submitted uh, to look at. I don't actually have the whole case, or didn't have the whole case to look at over the last few days. Um, I think I'll show this one first, because you can actually see this, uh, in this coronal view, there's large adult polycystic kidneys here. Uh, you can see there are multiple areas where there's increased protein density in some of the cysts. But all of this is very normal. This is what you see in adult polycystic kidneys. The, the bits of calcification you also see are very, very common normally in adult polycystic kidneys. So that none of this, even the calcification, is suggestive of TB. These kidneys are just adult polycystic kidneys. However, down in the right lower quadrant, you actually have a kidney that's much more bizarre, a transplant kidney. Uh, again, this was all done without IV contrast, which does limit the amount of information we can get out of this area. But there appears to be some hydronephrosis. There's some thickening of the urethelium. There's focal areas of calcification that seem to align the urethelium. Uh, it's a little hard to follow the ureter down. Go back here just uh, to the coronals. Uh, again, in this transplant kidney down here, it's the kidney itself isn't that small or uh, shrunken, but you can actually see where there's where you expect the renal pelvis to be. There's some calcifications that are scattered around, and they really don't look scattered like papillary calcifications. They actually look like they're part of the urethelium which suggests chronic inflammation uh, over time, leading to some fibrosis and scarring with calcification. Um, so again, you'd be, I think if you didn't have the calcification, you wouldn't be able to say too much about this. It could simply be ureteral stricture uh, versus from uh, the transplant problems of, of implanting the ureter, etc., with hydronephrosis and a kidney that's not working well. But as soon as you get that calcification, it becomes very, very suspicious for uh, TB. Uh, there's very, very few other things that will do this. I mean, it's just a as we talk about it. Uh, things like um, if you have severe rejection over a long time with thickening and inflammation of your uh, urethelium, uh, that, that over time with the fibrosis can calcify, but that would be pretty unusual. So 
again, and it's just the same sort of finding as we can see here, the sort of hydronephrosis with calcification along the urothelium there, which again is all suggestive of TB. The fact that it's hydronephrotic suggests that there's some scarring of the urodistally, uh, which in a transplant commonly, of course, is because of some anastomotic-related problem with fibrosis from the anastomosis, which is too tight. But in TB, of course, we know it does that. This is the second case. Um, which I give kudos to uh, Dr. Harris and Dr. McLaughlin for looking at this and saying there's a little microcalcification here, too small to treat. There's a slightly funny looking comma shaped kind of calcification here. But I think 99 times out of 100, we would just hit that thing with a lithotripture and it wouldn't work. And maybe two or three times down the road when it didn't break, we'd start investigating it. So to pick that up, not treat it, get a CT, uh, it's, uh, some, someone had a good coffee that day or was thinking it was really quite clear. So anyway, these are actually prone scans. So this is the left kidney here, and you can actually see the difference on this. And with enhancement, you can see things so much better. You've got all these cystic changes centrally in the pyramids uh, and medullary area of the kidney. The cortex is relatively spared. Uh, some hydronephrosis and some thickening of the mucosa with a suggestion of enhancement of the urothelium. Uh, some of this could be hydronephrosis, but it looks like too many little pockets and channels and so forth. So it's probably multiple infectious pockets that are eroding through the papilla into the collecting system, dumping material out. Again, very ratty and irregular here. Uh, pyonephrosis, a bacterial pyonephrosis, uh, pyogenic, can look something like this, but it usually is better, they're more discreet, the calyces are, more, are not as eroded, and uh, there's not as much destruction of urothelium because it's a more acute process, etc. And then the, uh, the, the urothelium still looks a bit thickened as it comes down. This is actually flipped around uh, just to show. I think it's, <clears throat> it's actually upside down, and, uh, a bit strange view. But anyway, this is the distal ureter here. You can see it's thick wall. The bladder actually looked, uh, on the non-contrast, it was collapsed, looked quite a bit thicker wall, but it's actually distends reasonably well. So there's mild thickening of the bladder wall, which again goes along with TB. It's interesting, you actually can't see the obstruction there. Uh, when you tapers down, it just seems to taper down and then disappear. The patient had a percutaneous nephrostomy. Very little imaging done because he was septic and infected at the time. This is actually one taken two months later. A tube change shows things quite a bit better. You can actually see that with the pressure of injection, there is obstruction because you're having to distend this with a fair bit of pressure because you can see this pilotubular backflow here outlining all the tubules. And that's why you can actually see the kidney, which shows there's really quite good preservation of renal parenchyma here. So the parenchyma is quite healthy in the cortical parenchyma. The papilla and calyces are a bit ratty and irregular. Uh, the upper pole is a little different. It's actually blown up and more hydronephrotic, the thinning of the parenchyma, because there's an internal uh, infundibular stenosis here, which is going to be a major problem in the long term, I think. And then you can actually see the ureter here has what we call a corkscrew ureter appearance. It actually seems to have, it seems to wind like a corkscrew. And it's probably eccentric involvement of plaques of fibrosis from uh, long term uh, infection and recurrent sort of lapsing, relapsing infection. It also can, in some cases, form a pipestone type ureter, which is a thick wall, straight pipe, where it's a more even involvement of the fibrosis. But this is a classic. And this is, no contrast is really getting through. That's what you're getting, this pile of tubular backflow here. This is really high pressure trying to push it down. So you can see a major drainage problem, fairly healthy kidney, particularly lower two-thirds, but a major issue with drainage here and here, which is going to make management difficult. I think that's it for images. So there was an nephrostogram, wasn't there? Yes, it's a renogram. A renogram. Just to show that there's... Yeah, the renogram simply shows a 5% difference in renal function. So the kidneys, with the nephrostomy and draining, the kidneys are putting out pretty good urine. The problem is how are you going to get the kidney to drain on its own long term? <coughs> so now we'd like to invite uh, Dr. Jones to come and talk to us about some pathology. Can I call your pointer? Oh, sure. So we received a, a left uh, total nephrectomy. Uh, That's how you got it to drain. And, and it drained, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, although this is actually not the case. Uh, this is uh, a, an example provided by uh, Dr. Poon of a um, put putty kidney, which is basically a uh, kidney that is obviously had the uh, pathologic process going on for a long time with uh, total replacement of the uh, kidney by uh, this caseous uh, 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 yellowish uh, material that if you could actually uh, 
palpate it uh, grossly would be crumbly and somewhat dry. The, the term caseous actually is a, a gross descriptive term that uh, refers to the material that is rather, uh, if you will, cheese-like, uh, some sort of cheese, I guess. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> and, and it's actually not a microscopic uh, term. Uh, thought to be related to the breakdown of the uh, particular uh, cell wall of the uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, bacterium. <clears throat> so a very dramatic example of uh, what can happen if it's just left to uh, uh, fester. <laughs> now this is the actual case uh, uh, two, uh, where we've taken the uh, uh, total nephrectomy specimen and uh, bisected it uh, longitudinally, and you're looking at the uh, uh, cut surfaces as it's been opened up like a book, uh, with the superior pole obviously up here where we have the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland is normal and not involved. Uh, the uh, uh, cut surfaces of the uh, kidney show modeling uh, uh, discoloration of the uh, uh, predominantly of the cortical area with um, uh, what uh, appear to be uh, uh, cavitary uh, lesions impinging on uh, the renal pelvis, um, although there, there are a number of uh, uh, findings in this kidney that um, uh, accompany uh, the granulomatous inflammation that I'll, I'll be showing you. Uh, this uh, to uh, palpate was generally uh, firm. The, the uh, discolored areas were, were quite firm. Um, note uh, that uh, we have the uh, uh, nephrostomy tubes in place. <clears throat> a, uh, a gross photograph to highlight uh, an area of the uh, ureter just as it's coming out of the renal pelvis to show uh, 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 lesional uh, tissue in the wall of the ureter, uh, which, which appears uh, that it most uh, would, would appear as a filling defect and has uh, an obstructive appearance in its uh, in its uh, impingement on uh, the lumen. And, and this was actually uh, somewhat soft uh, in its uh, texture. Uh, <clears throat> and then all, all the other uh, yellow uh, tissue, of course, as you know, is fat. Uh, <clears throat> and, and just a, another uh, closer view of the upper pole where uh, many of the uh, uh, discolored uh, nodular areas seem to be concentrated um, uh, uh, with uh, soft uh, inflammatory material in the renal pelvis region and all of these uh, uh, fir firmer nodules with a bit of a uh, cortical medullary uh, junction distribution. Note again, the adrenal gland is normal. On uh, microscopy, uh, we find a number of uh, 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 nodular uh, lesions uh, with some tendency to concentrate in the um, uh, cortical medullary junction uh, region. Uh, many of them have a rather a solid appearance. Uh, they're just a bit larger than the uh, adjacent uh, glomeruli, line. They're surrounded by nonspecific uh, inflammatory infiltrate with, uh, with fibrosis. And these are the uh, granulomatous uh, foci. Um, uh, intervening uh, renal parenchyma is really uh, intact with unremarkable uh, nephrons. And a higher magnification to show you the uh, granulomatous uh, focus of inflammation, which is showing uh, uh, fibrosis. Uh, there's a residual uh, uh, Langhans uh, giant cell at the perimeter. And, and the majority of the uh, 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 nodular <clears throat> lesions in the uh, uh, renal uh, cortex were sclerotic. I understand this patient uh, was uh, being treated and they had the appearance of, of healing uh, granulomatous uh, inflammatory foci, although there also were uh, the uh, more typical uh, granulomatous uh, foci uh, uh, with the uh, necrotic centers and that's what we would refer to on microscopy as uh, necrotizing uh, granulomatous uh, inflammation where we have uh, epithelioid histocytes, which is a defining cell of a granuloma arranged in a nodular uh, configuration. Uh, and classically in, in the context of TV, you have the lying hands, uh, giant cells uh, uh, in the granulomous lesion. Now a section of uh, the um, uh, rather dramatic lesion that I showed you uh, grossly in the upper uh, ure ureter is in, seen in this photo micrograph uh, where we have a large uh, active uh, necrotizing uh, granulomous uh, uh, focus. Uh, all of this is necrotic uh, material. We have the epithelioid histocytes at the uh, perimeter uh, rim of uh, the uh, central necrotic area with a Langhans uh, uh, giant cell with uh, peripherally distributed uh, multiple uh, nuclei characteristic of that cell. Uh, 
And this is what correlates with the grossly uh, defi uh, determined uh, uh, finding of uh, caseous material. And indeed, it's in this uh, lesion in the uh, ureter, uh, ureteric wall that uh, we found abundant uh, uh, acid fast bacilli, uh, curvilinear uh, uh, morphology, which is compatible with mycobacterium tuberculosis. Of course, you have to have the microbiological uh, uh, determinations to, uh, to uh, confirm the exact uh, species uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, but clearly, this is an active uh, uh, granulomatous uh, focus uh, that is seeding down the ureter, which is a well-known route of, of uh, spread. It, it gets to the kidney by uh, uh, hematogenous spread, uh, from the initial portal of entry being the lungs. And, uh, and the hematogenous spread uh, uh, explains the predilection for the cortical medullary junction, but then it, it, they grow, coalesce, and cavitate into the uh, uh, renal pelvis and seed down the urinary tract. Um, rather, uh, often the, uh, the acid fast bacilli are hard to find. Uh, in this case, in this area, they were uh, quite easy to find, uh, which, is, which is nice. Um, I, I should point out that a negative uh, ZN stain in the appropriate context certainly cannot be taken as, as something to exclude uh, TB. Uh, sensitivity uh, on tissue is generally pretty uh, low. In this kidney, there is also hydronephrosis uh, with an ascending... Um, uh, active uh, uh, pyelonephritis, uh, and here we have a dilated calioceal system uh, with a lot of uh, a lot of neutrophils, in fact, and, and inflammatory debris uh, surrounding uh, uh, inflammatory reaction uh, with acute neutrophils ascending the, uh, the tubules, and indeed in areas there was a, a xanthogranulomatous appearance uh, uh, along the borders of the uh, pelvic calioceal uh, system, which is. Uh, something to remind ourselves as pathologists that whenever we're diagnosing a, a, a usual case of xanthogranulomas pyelonephritis, we always have to exclude the possibility of TB uh, with special stains, as, as well as, as fungus, as fungi. It can also give you a granulomous inflammatory process. And uh, just a higher power to show you the, the uh, uh, sheet-like uh, uh, histocytic uh, reaction uh, adjacent to the pelvic calioceal system with the xanthogranulomas appearance. <laughs> and neutrophils accumulating in uh, the uh, tubules in, in, as a component of the active uh, polynephritis. Uh, there were no stones in uh, this kidney, uh, and, uh, and indeed in the sections that I had, calcification was not uh, a significant uh, feature. Uh, the um, uh, <coughs> remainder of the kidney was, uh, as I said, mentioned, uh, in between the uh, lesions uh, was unremarkable. We can show us a CT image of that stone, but it turns out to be calcified lymph node. There's a small lymph node that's about uh, 12, 14 millimeters. That's about a third calcified, and that's what you're saying that created the <coughs> diagnosis of the stone. Is that we, we did have some lymph nodes with this kidney, which which uh, were uh, simply reactive in a non-specific way with a, a few areas of irregular fibrosis. They didn't have the nodular fibrotic appearance of healing granuloma. There were no active granulomas in, in the lymph nodes. Thank you very much. So now we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Bowie here from the Division of Infectious Disease at uh, here at BC. BCG. I can BCG. steal a point or two. There you go. Thank you. How do I move it down? Just, just, just next. Like next. That. Okay. Hi, so I was asked to talk about uh, the treatment of TB, and I'm largely going to focus on the, the regimens we use to treat mycobacterial disease. Clearly, particularly the second case, who I knew, the hardest part of, of initiating treatment is making the diagnosis. And so a sad part of it is this fellow was from the Philippines, where I'm going to show you there's lots of TB, and he'd been febrile for a bunch of months and sick, and nobody had twigged the diagnosis. However, it was still a, you know, a astute diagnosis when he presented with his urologic uh, symptoms. And the second hard part of treatment is often not the treatment of the tuberculosis, but in many cases the treatment of the underlying disease. So for example, HIV, etc., which again I'm not going to talk about, but uh, and this second, I don't know the first fellow, but the second fellow was HIV negative, and so I'm just going to skip that. So. Uh, doesn't like me. This? I'm going to get stuck here. <clears throat> so treatment for tuberculosis has become 
very, very standardized, and I'll take you through this in a moment, but basically six-month treatment regimens are now uh, highly effective for most types of tuberculosis. And so although this looks a bit confusing, <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> this is about pulmonary TB, but I'm going to show you a treatment for renal TB is the same. Uh, initial therapy, whether uh, someone in pulmonary TB has cavitation on chest X-ray or has positive smears uh, at two months or no cavitation on chest X-ray, we all recommend starting off with a four-drug regimen. INH, rifampin, ethambutol, pyrazinamide. Then the course can vary somewhat at that four, at that two month uh, period, but most patients will end up on INH and rifampin. For the initial two months, there may be some changes made if the patient's not doing well, but in patients who are doing well, they get another two months of INH and rifampin. So a four drug initial regimen followed by uh, and four drugs for two months, followed by two drugs for four months. And if the patient's doing well and there's no resistance to, uh, uh, to these uh, agents, then patients do well on these regimens. If patients take the medication, there's about 95% cure rate and, and less than a 5% relapse rate. So it's become very, very effective. Can I ask a question about sure. the um, uh, how much benefit is there for a four-drug treatment as opposed to, say, a two- or three-drug treatment? I'm just curious as far as how much delta do you get with um, such a multi-drug? So you mean if, if we had, if we just simply start off with a two-drug regimen? Yes. If, <clears throat> if you were to use INH and rifampin, for example, all the way through, you'd probably need at least 12 months of therapy to, to get similar cure rates and maybe, <clears throat> and maybe not quite as good because now at least because of resistance. So um, getting patients to take their medications is uh, a significant chore. And so the four drug regimen is efficacious in a much shorter period of time and patients are more likely to take their medication over the, over the six month period of time. What's RPT? Uh, RPT is, is uh, rifibutin. It's a, a version of rifampin, which I'm, I'm going to try and ignore for today's purposes. But, it's not on the test? Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't have to take tests anymore. So. <laughs> um, is it an expensive drug regimen? Um, <clears throat> not largely. In this province, uh, it's all paid for by, through the BC CDC and the uh, TB control program. And so, uh, but, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm recovering from a cold here, so I'm going to lose my voice from time to time. <laughs> well, it's crossed my mind because I've had, <laughs> to, <laughs> I looked after a TB ward in, uh, in uh, northern South Africa about 18 months ago, and I've had two febrile respiratory illnesses in the last <laughs> six weeks, so I'm a little worried here, but I don't think I have TB. And my skin test was negative after I came back, so. <laughs> no way is Marty. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I think, yeah. So, so I, I have to move something here to get me to go forward. What am I doing wrong here? Sometimes it freezes. You have to just click here. Click where? Sorry. Just on the gray. Oh, up there. Okay. So, so treatment of exoprolinary TB is largely the same. Uh, I'll show you the, the two exceptions. Um, United, well, the United Kingdom, the WHO, uh, recommend the same regimens as for pulmonary TB, and they follow them. Canada, the United States, also recommends the total six-month course, but there's a very low threshold to prolong many folks to ni a total nine months. The same initial four-drug, two-month regimen uh, and then uh, seven months of, of the, of the two-drug regimen. There's absolutely no evidence in support of that, but um, we all have what I call our idiot syncrasies, and, and for some reason or other, that's part of uh, the, the approach. 
One of the other thing, questions that comes up, and we noodled this a little bit actually in the second fellow, is the role of adjunctive steroids. Uh, he clearly had extensive inflammatory disease, is, is both in the kidney and the ureter, and what happened, you saw what happened. Um, the only good evidence for adjunctive steroids is in uh, meningitis and pericardial TB. Although there's anecdotal use of steroids for renal TB, there's no solid evidence. And so we, in fact, didn't recommend it in, in this gentleman. I'm not usually this klutzy trying to figure out where I'm supposed to go. I'm, seeing, I'm still not seeing what you're doing, but anyway, you're making it work. So the wrinkle in these six-month regimens, though, is resistance to tuberculosis. Um, I'm just going to take you through a little bits of this, but this, the, the key areas here are folks who have TB born in Canada, folks who have TB who are born outside of Canada. In terms of new active cases, it looks like Susceptibility is relatively similar, 85% in Canada, 83% in foreign-born. Resistance to INH, INH alone, uh, or INH but not INH and rifampin, is a big difference, 1.6% and 6.8% difference. And I'm not going to talk about multi-resistant TB or now uh, heaven help us, there are actually totally resistant TB cases in, in uh, India where we have no poisons that work. In terms of him, though, the second fellow, he came from the Philippines, so we actually have fairly good data. And so these, again, are uh, uh, Canadian data. This certainly got bumped around in transferring from my system to your system, but we can figure it out. So, in Canada, uh, in seven, there were 1,712 cases, uh, and then a foreign-born, 450 actually came from the Philippines. So, folks in the Philippines constitute a significant amount of our uh, cases of tuberculosis that we see here. Any resistance, 4.3%, 16% in the Philippines, and INH resistance, 2%, 13%. So, we had a strong suspicion this fellow might be INH resistant, uh, and in fact, uh, he was. Um, the treatment recommendations for INH resistant TB are all, are all over the map and are not, uh, are not uh, evidence-based. So these, I'll just show you two sets of re recommendations. These are from the Canadian guidelines of 2006. So they talk about an initial phase, and let's just talk about daily, of the HRZE is the four-drug regimen that we're used to using, and the H is in brackets because we don't actually know whether uh, I, INH or, uh, is useful in treatment of INH-resistant tuberculosis, but most of us still use it. And then followed by four months of now three drugs, rifampin, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol, so a different four-drug regimen. There's no evidence that that's better, and in fact, the WHO in more recent guidelines, 2010, come out and say quite clearly <coughs> uh, that in populations with known or suspected high levels of INH resistance, new TB patients may receive HRE as therapy and continuing in phase as an alternative to uh, H and R. That's expert opinion. It's not based on data. So let's come back to, to case number two, the fellow who was masquerading as a stone. So fortunately, uh, we got the isolate from him, and in fact, we got the isolate many times. His, it grew in his urine. Uh, uh, it wasn't actually seen on smear in his urine. A, a smear to detect TB on a urine sample is incredibly low sensitivity. And that's one of the reasons we pushed for a direct aspirate from the kidney, which was just filled with AFB. It grew quickly. 
and it was INH resistant. So the, the TB docks at uh, uh, TB control modified his regimen based on, uh, I think, gut feeling. And they elected to give him the standard four drug regimen for four months. He had a urine culture at three and a half months, which was negative. And so they made a decision to drop him down to INH, rifampin, and ethamutol with a plan for five more months. So at about total five months, he had this the surgery. So those pathology slides that were shown with all the AFB seen were, were done on five months of, of fairly aggressive TB therapy. And so it showed lots of AFB. Unfortunately, which is the bane of the ID existence, no culture was sent. Now, we didn't need a culture for diagnosis here, but we sure would want to have, or would like to have had a culture to retest his isolate to see if there was any change in susceptibility pattern. Because we don't have that, and because he's had bad disease, I, I've been talking with the TB control people. They'll, they'll sort of have a meeting and panel him, but I think they're going to get more aggressive, and instead of using INH, rifampin, and ethambutol, I th they're likely to continue rifampin and ethambutol, but add either uh, pyrazinamide or fluoroquinolone uh, because of the extent of his disease. And uh, I think that's the last of my part, and you're going to talk about surgery. Uh, uh, one, what, what is the rough monthly cost of the medication? I have absolutely, oh, I have absolutely no idea, except these drugs are dirt cheap. Okay, they're all once, you, once you start getting to the... the the more fancy ones, they get more expensive. But these regimens, uh, I, I hesitate to even guess, but I'll bet you it's less than a dollar a day because they're mass produced. And Sorry, can I, can I just say, for example, this guy five years from now needs cups for a kidney transplant? And should, should we consider him cured? Or does he still have TB in him that needs to be treated at the time of this? So, so if he completes all this therapy and he looks like he's done well, no more measure of disease. So, so once people have completed a full course of therapy, we usually consider them cured, and we do not, you know, go on and recommend, you know, further INH, for example, if he came to transplant. Now, obviously, you have to use your clinical acumen, and you're looking for other clues that there may be problems. But usually, we we consider them cured with an incredibly low rate of. Uh, Relapse, especially if they've gone beyond several years with the <coughs> occurrence. Okay. What should we culture? We culture the kidney or the blood? When we when you say that we wish a culture had been done, do you actually want to culture? Well, I, will, I mean, the yeah, money lies kidney. the money lies in the uh, in the caveus necrosis in the or the brain yeah. necrotic yeah. material in the kidney. So for him, I would like to have had a culture at least. With Ideally, several cultures of material right from the right from the kidney. What are the odds that would still severe positive, but not actually culture anything? Would it probably be positive for culture then? Oh, I'm sure. I have no doubt. I mean, those look like really juicy. Oh, that was uh, very. I have no yeah. doubt that it'd be culture positive. So again, the culture is not for diagnosis. Yeah, the culture is to see, you know, did he have mixed? You know, has he acquired resistance? Did he have another type of resistance that we missed? So that was the, you know, that's the reason that we would want. There's a whole bunch of hands up. I don't know if it's going to screw up your schedule. No, we can. Let's, let's answer the questions. Yeah. As the person that's supposed to get that aspirate, uh, if there's urine, we can aspirate the urine. If you're trying to get Casey's material, how would you suggest we go about getting that and how much do we need? Well, from him, the whole kidney was there. Oh, yeah, but I mean, initially, when we actually, the first, uh, like that was, the kidney came on six months after the diagnosis. But, 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 the, but the, the, he had, he had a direct aspirate from the kidney as, on his... Urine, that's right, we had, when we perked him, we had that aspirate of the urine, yeah, they sent it to you. You know, it was clear that he had all sorts of abnormalities going on in his, in his kidney, so he had just, uh, when he had the nephrostomy tube in, some of that material was sent, and it was, I think, four plus... AFB positive on smear, and then it, it actually blew up quickly. I had basically the same yeah. question. Okay. Interesting, the ZN 
failed to demonstrate acetylpascosilite in the renal cortical uh, foci, even though it's in the necrotic ones, but in the ureter, that's where, that's where there was this very uh, robust growth of acetylpascosilite. I wonder what's going on down the urinary tract, and, and may even, and of course, the other kidney is, uh, could be an issue. Well, that's partly why I said cultures, you know, different, you know, sample from different sites, depending on what the, the, sec the pathology actually looked like or what the tissue looked like, you wouldn't have the pathology back. Did your uh, checking for initial resistances, are they from the, the, the first urine sample, or how do you follow that? So whenever, uh, so it grew from multiple sites, but I suspect that they cultured the one, they did the one from the kidney rather than the urine because it came up more quickly. So you're, uh, you're and then, able to tell pretty early on? Then, then I don't know. I'm sorry? You're, you're able to tell early on that there's resistance? Yeah, so, so as soon as it grows up, the next thing that's done in the lab is to, to, to regrow it and determine what it's susceptible or resistant to. Yeah. Now, there are, there are now non-culture techniques that can do that more quickly. Oddly enough, they're available in the quotes third world, yeah. and we don't have them here, but the ones we do here require actually growth of the organism. Yeah. Great, so here's the urology rounds. We'll talk about our uh, surgical management and our surgical happy endings for our cases. Um, so about 55% of uh, all GUTB will eventually require surgical intervention, and as we talked about, important to defer the surgery ideally until um, some medical therapy has been instituted at least three to six weeks. So the indications for intervening surgically to relieve obstruction, so this could be nephrostomy tube versus <coughs> stenting versus open surgery for obstruction like a ureteric reimplant for distal uh, stricture, drain infected material for definitive local therapy such as um, genital TB or uh, formal reconstruction pyeloplasty. Um, the nephrectomy uh, that was done in both cases um, for native kidneys can be done either MIS or open. There's good evidence that they're equivalent, except the only difference being uh, the MIS takes significantly longer for uh, <coughs> operative time. And indications uh, from our Campbell's textbook um, when nephrectomy should be done are listed on the screen. Which the ureter can just take I don't. I don't think it said when I read our textbook. I don't think it said anything about how much ureter. I mean, practically, I guess you'd assume you wouldn't do a formal nephro-U, especially if there's no involvement of the ureter, but... Should, should that yeah. 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 Just the ureter is obstructed, the stump is obstructed yeah. as well. Yeah. So in this, in this patient, the indication for surgery was in jail then? Well, the whole, the whole ureter being involved, that there was no... And Dr. Patterson spoke with the patient about different options. Um, if you were going to save the kidney, <clears throat> The amount of disease ureter that would have need to be removed was so extensive. He needed ileal ureter, um, and with a totally normal contralateral kidney, in this patient, it was felt that probably a MIS ne simple nephrectomy would be best How for him. How does this guy manage for that six month interval without the joint? Is he stented or he have any He had he had the the per ne nephrostomy tubes. For six months. Yeah, yeah. He's had it changed uh, a couple times, <laughs> and well, he ended up with medical therapy, and I think he had his case about uh, one month ago. The nephrectomy went well, in the note. Um, some different options surgically, augmentation cystoplasty for a severely contracted uh, tuberculous bladder. We do TURP for um, granul granulomatous prostatitis, stricture disease in the urethra can be managed in a typical fashion, um, and then of course for genital TB or for, uh, for abscess. So um, case number one uh, was managed with um, eight months of medical therapy with Fampin, Ethambutol, and Biaxin. He received uh, prednisone Imran and then underwent a transplant nephrectomy. He received another uh, six months post-op of um, medical therapy as there was some active disease noted mm -hmm. in his um, transplant nephrectomy specimen. And case number two, um, initially it was attempted a cystoscopy and a stent, but the ureteric orifice could not be visualized. The whole bladder urethelium was involved, um, and as soon as the bladder was distended, uh, it cracked and there was a lot of hematuria noted. Um, so it was elected to go ahead with a nephrostomy tube for him. And interestingly, he was on the ward for about three weeks uh, undergoing CBI because there was so much hematuria from that initial cystoscopy. So the bladder urethelium was very friable. He was started uh, here on isoniazid, rifampin, ethambutol, and then underwent the delayed um, MIS simple nephrectomy. Uh, looking at the OR note, Dr. Patterson did the case. Unfortunately, couldn't be here today. It was uncomplicated. Um, there's no note made about exactly how distal they went on the... Um, on the ureter, but it was a, a standard simple nephrectomy um, carried out. 
So that's it for today. Thanks very much to Dr. Rowley, Dr. Jones, Dr. Bowie. Yes.